Talk Show. Recorded live. Hello, everybody, and welcome tonight to the uh, University of Acadia uh, Talk Show, the regular Wednesday night talk show for Wednesday, the 24th of August, 2011. Uh, unfortunately, Terry is unable to host tonight, so uh, this is Frank O'Collins. And tonight I will be hosting as, as well as speaking. So thank you to all those who have come on to the call listening live through TalkShoe. And I also thank those that will be downloading this call later, which will be available through University of Acadia, um, dot com, uh, sorry, University of Acadia, uh, dot info, University Acadia dot info. Uh, tonight um, I want to, as just the normal format for these calls, for the first hour, what I'd like to do is update you on the material that we have been researching this week. Uh, I'll be talking about some follow-on from last week when we discussed the fact that in the system they declare us in test state, and because we are declared in test state, we have no will, and if we have no will, we have no standing in probate court. So I'm looking forward to covering some follow-up with you tonight from that important research of last week. I also look forward to covering with you uh, some further discussion in terms of trusts. I also like to discuss with you the structure and presumptions of control, not only in terms of intestate, but some of the other controls and how that information is pigeonholed between different control groups because intestate is not always necessarily the knowledge of remedy when we're dealing with, for example, the tax office or if we're dealing with a particular government department. And I'll explain that. So there's a few things to cover tonight and we'll go through those in the first hour. After we cover the first hour, I then look forward to being able to answer questions that you may have either through the chat by asking you to type the word question and then the information, or by typing star eight or hash eight, I think it is, star eight, uh, and then putting yourself in the queue where I'd love to hear from you speaking to you. So let's start by just doing a recap of what we've been discussing last week in the last couple of weeks for those that may be first time listeners and those that have listened to the call but it's worthwhile doing a summary. So what we discussed last week as an important insight is understanding the simplicity of a presumption of control that their system has been doing to us for at least 120 years by presuming we are in intestate from the age of seven onwards and therefore without a will and by not having a will that the judges and the trustees can presume the role of the executor they can administer our affairs our estate according to their statutes through their surrogate courts and that we have no standing. Now, for a number of you, this was new information, and certainly this is information that we have come close to recognizing for a while, but maybe not have expressed it as clearly as we did. And it is important because as we unearth pieces of their system, as we constantly look for remedy, and is there remedy? And if there is remedy, how do we go about that remedy? One of the things that I and I think many people can be guilty of is that we make things more complicated than they need to be. Now let us recap here that we are talking about a system that when you go to court, and if you've been to court, you've seen court, you've been present when people have been in court, I doubt you've ever seen a judge, a magistrate, a clerk or anyone in that court break out in a sweat. The system appears largely to be functioning in a very easy manner, a very simple manner. In other words, the concepts that are underpinning their system of control must, in essence, 
be very simple. And there's always a guilt that we make things more complicated than they need to be. Well, being declared intestate may be done through a, a fairly complex manner, but the concept itself is very simple. Intestate means that you are without a will. Intestate means that you are effectively to be administered by uh, the public trustees uh, because there is no will uh, and that because there is no will, uh, any of the heirs become wards of the state uh, and then are placed under guardianship. Very simple, very easy and absolutely brilliant. So we're going to go through that in a bit more detail in a moment. We're going to get through a bit more information in terms of uh, the implications of what this means. And a few weeks ago, and I just want to mention this because there is a lot of information that we've been sharing. And a few weeks ago, we did mention, and this is on the site one-heaven.org, we mentioned that we are dealing in all these cases with presumptions of law. Presumptions that if are not rebutted, stand true. And if there is one element in their system that we can point to under legal realism, the philosophy that was introduced at the end of last century to render history null and void, to produce a crew of lawyers, of new legal graduates that cared not for the history but merely for the present, it is the principle of presumption. And a few weeks ago, what we did under, where is it? Under one heaven, under positive law, and under Article 299 Roman Court. So if you go to the site one-heaven.org, you click on positive law, and you go to Article 299, then what that shows to you, hopefully, is under Canon 3228, 12 key presumptions that they are using against us constantly. And those presumptions include the presumption of the public record, public service, public oath, immunity, summons, custody, guardians, trustees, government acting in two roles as executor and beneficiary, executive son tort, incompetence and guilt. And I do recommend all of you, if you could please, go back and have a look at Article 299 of the Roman Court, the 12 key presumptions of the Roman Court. Because one of the things that we have struggled constantly is to understand these base presumptions that they're using against us. Now, I'll give you an example of how unfair the system is. As if you've been listening to these calls, you know that we have spent a large amount of time and a lot of effort in the development of what we call the ecclesiastical deed poll. The ecclesiastical deed poll is very clear. It states our intent that we are born with rights, that we have a direct relationship with the divine creator, and that no one, no one stands between us and the divine. Furthermore, we make very clear in the ecclesiastical deed poll that all elements of the estate are under our administration and that they must reveal now all those elements to us. I mention this because what we will be talking again tonight about is that in their system, title, the name of something, its form, is considered more important than its substance. In other words, I can write an ecclesiastical deed poll, I can be clear with my intent, but if the form does not stay, say will and testament, if the words do not comport to the standard words that they expect, then they will not recognise it. And this, I believe, is one of the frustrations that I hope we can again address tonight and overcome. Well, let's start then with the first point I want to cover tonight on the structure of presumptions and control in their system. When we talk about the concept of intestate, 
This is a concept, I believe, that is held as secret knowledge in the domain of the private bar guild and is not necessarily extended far throughout the system. One of the tricks of the Roman system, one of the tricks of the government, is to compartmentalise knowledge so that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Now, intestate, being in a position where you are declared lost and abandoned, your estate is managed on your behalf on the presumption that you are lost, you're dead, you're abandoned, that uh, any minor is a ward of the state, is key information of control in the court. But there are other forms of control. There are other structures and presumptions of control. And let's go through those now so we are absolutely clear. We spoke about a few weeks ago now and we have gone back through this a couple of times now to discuss the birth certificate, the origin of the birth certificate. And the origin of the birth certificate is as what was called a settlement certificate, a certificate that identified the holder as a set law. Now, there's a word that is used even in today in terms of trust deeds, a set law. And a more recent word that was created for the holder of a birth certificate was a resident. That is a resident of a settlement. Now we are recognized as being born to some settlement and our birth certificate is evidence of that. Now we stated that the reason for the settlement certificate was that when the common land, when the commonwealth was started to be privatized and stolen in England in the 18th and 19th century. They produced wave after wave of disenfranchised peasant without the means of growing their own food and therefore without the means of survival. And the obligation was placed on the parish upon the local church to administer to the paupers and provide for their assistance. Now, of course, this was part of a larger plan to convert the peasants from poor agriculture into effectively being machines as part of the industrial machinery of the Industrial Revolution. The great advances in the Western world, which is attributed to the Industrial Revolution, was on the bones, backs and sweat and pain of those that first were thrown off the land and second imprisoned in the most horrendous workhouses, places worse than prisons, attached to factories, to mines, to the most horrendous environments where they basically worked until they died purely for the benefit of a place to sleep and a few crumbs to eat. And this was the origin of the settlement certificate, the identity that the parish was obliged to provide sustenance to these poor. And eventually, of course, they put them in workhouses. They basically franchised the poor out to the gentry for the private profit of the elite. Now, today, of course, with the birth certificate, there is the knowledge that to the private side, to the private elite, the birth certificate is extremely valuable. Indeed it is. It is seen as a token, a token that they create, that they control, that recognises the creation of bonds, that recognises a security. Now I've heard from people saying that that a birth certificate is a receipt, that a birth certificate is a bill of lading, and all these things. I want to be clear because we have written this in to the canons and the research has been done. And whilst registrars and others may speak in terms of a birth certificate being valuable, either from their own imaging or from their own belief of how valuable it is to their system, the reality is that to us the birth certificate is nothing 